is not a subject for dinner conversation, but it is important to talk with your doctor immediately if you have a problem. Incontinence, tonight, on call with the Prairie Doc. Good evening, and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. Our show tonight was recorded this last summer through the gracious hospitality of Pier 81 Resort and Restaurant on Lake Ponset. We sincerely thank our, their staff and management for opening this beautiful facility to us. Urinary incontinence, the loss of bladder control, is a common and often embarrassing problem. When it may affect women and men, the majority of sufferers are female. The severity ranges from occasionally leaking urine when you cough or sneeze to having an urge to urinate that's so sudden and strong you don't get to the restroom in time. To help us answer questions about urinary incontinence and the various treatments are Matthew Barker, who is the Avera Medical Group Urogynecology in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and John Langdon, New Wave Biosciences Chief Medical Strategist, Strategist and Governor of the American College of Physicians, Florida chapter, and prior um, internist from Sioux Falls, South Dakota. So uh, let's talk a little bit about our background. John, tell, mm -hmm. tell me a, bit, a little bit about this strategist job that you have. Well, you and I are both internal medicine specialists, so our job is to think right. and sometimes act, actually try to treat people. But yeah. We try to do it as conservatively as possible. Uh, for some reason, among all the specialties, we remember the promise we made to first do no harm. So we try to look for treatment modalities that are the least interventional as possible, the least medication, the least side effect potential. So an incontinence, while it's a gigantic problem, there are lots of things you can do. And we're going to visit with Matt about some of the ones that are kind of on the very aggressive, really remodel that body sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, he's a surgeon. He's a surgeon, and he yeah. rebuilds things. And I'm an internist. and. I try to educate people on things that they can do. So my job as chief medical strategist for New Wave Biosciences is to constantly be looking for minimally invasive ways to help people with a variety of problems. And, well, and GYN is, I mean, in, well, in and, continence, continence is, is one of those. Yeah, absolutely. And as like I say, uh, hardly anybody dies from incontinence unless you die from embarrassment. Or is that right? Is that reasonable? Matter? No, that is, that is very true. I mean, I think it's a, a classic condition that, uh, you know, once that happens, then they won't seek treatment because they're so embarrassed. They're even embarrassed to talk to their primary care docs. And so I, you bring up a good point. But I, to, to defend the surgeons out there, I want you to know we also think I don't just do <laughs> interventions or uh, complex surgeries. I, I take a look at the whole perspective of incontinence, specifically for women. And you so got to remember, yeah. I spent three years of my life only studying incontinence and problems and pelvic floor issues in women. And that's the same amount of time you guys spent learning to become internists. Oh, so, well, all right. Oh, so we had to do I, I oh, think it's important to learn body. to think, but also be uh, able to uh, do something act, for them. <laughs> yes. Well, and uh, correct the problem. Yeah. And that's what I hope I can do for people. And so, we know you do. <laughs> and we do uh, know you do. But you're in the surgical uh, field. Correct. Now, tell us a little bit about what brought you to that field. Well, it's great being here with you guys because uh, I have a history with both of you. I've known both of you probably since when I can remember. Uh, Dr. Langdon and Sioux Falls growing up and you through uh, knowing you, uh, working with my father who was a gastroenterologist in the community for many, many years. So it's an honor to be with such distinguished uh, thinkers, I should call you now, Thank right? you. <laughs> Thank you All for right. that. And, uh, but for me, I liked women's health. I did an obstetrics and gynecology residency, and then I enjoyed uh, reconstructive surgery or pelvic floor uh, disorder treatments for women, and that led me to urogynecology. And urogynecology is a, a more general term for our specialty, which is female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery. And you can do a four-year residency in OBGYN and then a three-year fellowship in urogynecology, or you can do a five-year residency in uh, urology and then a two-year fellowship 
to get boarded in female pelvic medicine oh, you or can, reconstructive surgery. You can come from both, both Correct. sides. And I would say the majority of it, almost 90% of them come from the obstetrics and gynecologic training, which I think is, uh, given that they only treat women, I think it uh, provides a little uh, broader spectrum because we'll talk about it. It's not just the bladder is the issue. There are other factors that can be involved. Where did you do your training? So uh, I, USD grad, uh, from medical school, then I went to the University of Wisconsin, and then I trained in Cincinnati, Ohio for my fellowship. And uh, Cincinnati hospitals? Good Samaritan Hospital in Cincinnati. Okay. I have a question sure. that I'd like to throw in, and something we're always asking people, because I work with a lot of doctors, and try to encourage people to try to discover issues relative to the pelvic floor, and I was just wondering what your take on what's a healthy pelvic floor mean to you for a woman? Well, I mean, a healthy pelvic floor for someone is continent, it provides normal function. And normal function of the pelvic floor is mictrition or urination and emptying the bladder, emptying the bowels, sexual function as well as uh, reproduction. And uh, those so are- four things. Yeah, those are the things that uh, the pelvic floor does. And when those aren't working correctly, well, that's why there are people like myself and, and as well as your guys' interest in this to, to help people. Well, so we have urinary incontinence, but there's also rectal incontinence. I suppose you deal with that as well, don't you? We do. I mean, so, you know, when someone presents to uh, a physician with urinary incontinence, there's a high correlation with incontinence of stool or what they sometimes called accidental bowel leakage or uh, fecal incontinence or stool incontinence. And they're always looking for terms. You know, when we talk about urinary incontinence, we have the term overactive bladder. And you got to remember the term overactive bladder became a term to sell medications. Right, right, right. All right, and now it is part of medical jargon. So when you t ask your patients or you write in your, your note saying, oh, this patient has overactive bladder, it actually is a syndrome that we now recognize, but that stemmed from a marketing campaign of okay. uh, a company that wanted to sell medicines to prevent leakage. Uh, and bef before we get uh, into too tight and too overactive and too spastic of a bladder, and or comparing it to a relaxed and too dysfunctional, too unmuscled of a bladder. Let's get back to rectal uh, and uh, the demographics of it all. What percentage of women over 40, for example, have urinary incontinence, over 80 have urinary incontinence, and, and what is the percentage of, of, of rectal incontinence? So if you look at uh, overall urinary incontinence, just the broad term, having an accident of leakage when you're not supposed to, which right. is never, you're supposed to be continent. Or, and uh, that is over 50% of women will have an episode of incontinence in their lifetime. And if you, I would use the cutoff about 65. And under the age of 65, as is after childbirth, women in their 30s, 40s, most women experience stress urinary incontinence. And that can be high as one in three or one in 10. I mean, it's, it's a fairly high number. And then as women get older, they develop more urgency or urge incontinence symptoms where they can't make it to the toilet in time, which we call overactive bladder or urge urinary incontinence. And that progressively increases as women age. So not only is it a factor related to childbirth, there's also the factor that relates to uh, aging process. And I think what's more common uh, is where women have mixed urinary incontinence. They have aspects of both that need to be treated. And this is where it helps for seeing people like yourselves to kind of help women realize that this is an urge episode versus a stress incontinence episode. And there's a high incidence of combined. Correct. There's lots of folks that have So both. explain that just a little bit more. Okay, so, so there's this group that have a, a bladder that is constantly wanting to empty. It doesn't expand well. It's just kind of always a little bit irritable and they have to go and they have to go and they have to go uh, and, uh, and it squeezes sometimes and then there's an incontinence episode. And then there's this too relaxed of a bladder, doesn't function well, doesn't empty. What percentage of them are the relaxed and which one are the over, overactive spastic bladder? Well, you're talking about the... the and which one is the mixed? The, so mixed incontinence is when they leak when the urethra is not strong enough to hold in urethra the urine. Okay. So after childbirth, the muscles stretch, which I think we'll talk about, uh, of the pelvic floor. As those muscles stretch, they can't maintain that constant tone of the pelvic floor to keep urine in. So the pressure in the urethra actually gets less than the pressure in the bladder. Uh, and so when that happens uh, with an activity, it's just coughing, sneezing, lifting, running, the leak urine. That is stress incontinence. Urge incontinence is this, where you talk about spasticity of the bladder, where the bladder 
contracts when it's not supposed to. So normally the bladder should maintain its relaxation. You feel the urge to go when it gets really full and you make your way to the bathroom. You relax your muscles, the bladder contracts and urine comes out and you've voided. Right. What happens with urge incontinence, that smooth muscle of the bladder, which is called the detrusor muscle, uh, that is under involuntary control. It's not like your bicep muscle, right. it's like your heart. It just does its work. That contracts prematurely. We don't understand why that happens necessarily at times. We know that there's certain neurologic processes, certain uh, infections or other injuries can lead to those problems or pelvic floor prolapse or these types of things, but it's still considered a syndrome. We don't really actually know the true cause. Okay, that's interesting to me. I, I often think some of that is that people are so nervous that they're constantly thinking about their bladder and they become hyper sensitive to their bladder needs and, and they're, they're in spasm. You think there's any truth to that? Well, I think people get so worried about accidents and you know, John lives in Florida now, so he has long car rides, just like we have long car rides here in South Dakota. And you know an accident's gonna occur. So pretty soon you start knowing every single rest drop and bathroom. So it becomes this behavioral change that has slowly evolved over time. Yeah, so there's a behavioral component. 100%. John. Yeah, well, you, you know, you begin to accommodate to this. Uh, that's why people drive motorhomes because there's a bathroom one of them in the back. Get up and go to the bathroom when they're on these long distance trips. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, and uh, we've made more than one quick pit stop on our trips yeah, as okay. well. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and I'd also like to uh, take a chance to talk about the men involved in this too, because while women have really gotten the lion's share of attention on this, uh, there's a growing issue of incompetence in men. And it's due to an, a number of things. One is just age, and of course, and prostatic disease, uh, urinary tract infections, chronic prostatitis, and all things that are difficult to treat. <clears throat> and then there's the sequelae of radical prostatectomy. And men who have radical prostatectomy have problems controlling both their urination and maintaining their sexual function. Many of them will get better over a long period of time slowly but they're poorly responsive to the typical therapies that we'll offer women, the Kegel exercises, the drugs, and we, we'll get into the drugs, but unfortunately, the drugs for incontinence tend to have side effect profiles that look like the side effects of aging, the older you get. <laughs> so if you want to feel old, try taking some of these drugs and you'll get some of the dry mouth and the like this and that off. and the other thing, constipation, other problems that are associated with aging. But another interesting group of men are returning soldiers from these Afghan and other theaters of war where they've been out and redeployed and they've been carrying these 110 pound backpacks around for years. And there's a growing incidence in the VA system of these younger soldiers returning who are having problems with urge and stress incontinence. And I don't think it's really well understood what happens, but there could be some changes in bladder irritability, sensitivity, chronic infection, recurrent infections, a whole host of things that seem to cause problems. But there may be some chronic structural changes that occur in their pelvic floor as well. Because uh, while women are delivering babies through their pelvic floor, these guys are shouldering huge loads which increase intra-abdominal pressure and probably affect over time their bladder floor, their pelvic floor, all the muscles of the perineum. So there are various approaches to trying to do something about that. And we can talk a little bit more about that that, that aren't invasive. Yeah. Well, if you look at like, you know, they're asking about the incidence of urinary incontinence, especially overactive bladder or right. urgency, urgent incontinence. You know, after the age of 80, men and women equally face this problem. Sure. More women are living longer um, and it's much easier to screen sometimes for these women. The government healthcare has a screen for urinary incontinence in women, but it, it really is a, a factor of aging as well. Mm -hmm. And I, I think you bring up a good point about the musculature, not only of the pelvic floor muscles, but just the smooth muscle aspect of mm -hmm. the bladder itself. Yeah, it brings me to that Kegels or Kegels exercise. I think we agreed, the three of us agreed it's Kegels, don't, haven't we? But I learned my whole uh, time that it's uh, uh, Kegels. Either way, this exercise that we can do to tighten uh, the, the sphincter and the pelvic floor muscles. Uh, don't you think that some of the reason uh, that uh, this happens uh, the, as we get older is because we're not exercising that muscle group? Uh, is it be, just like Speak the- Speak for yourself, uh, Rick, all right? I mean, there's, a, there's certain muscles we can, we can you're exercise. Lot, you're a lot but, younger yeah. than we are. It's easier for you to get that exercise. 
But I know you're, you're, I think yes and no. I think the big issue with pelvic floor muscles, uh, and especially doing Kegels, remember uh, Dr. Kegel was a, a, a general, uh, I think he might have been an obstetrician and gynecologist who kind of realized that, hey, there's ways to strengthen these muscles and recognize the importance of the pelvic floor muscles to do exercises. And this in turn, uh, that most gynecologists or obstetricians would talk to their patients about, hey, make sure you contract your pelvic floors. and and unfortunately only about 30 percent of women can actually isolate those muscles and meaning that they need assistance and help rectify identifying what those muscles do for them so it's not just kind of saying hey while you're sitting in the car or uh you know while you before you go to bed at night contract your pelvic floor muscles they actually may need some physical therapy to uh isolate those muscles all right we're going to take a break we'll be back right after this Hi, we're back talking with doctors Matt Barker, a urogynecologist from Sioux Falls, and Dr. John Langdon, a internist from Florida, joining us uh, with the topic of urinary incontinence in women. Uh, so let's talk more about Kegels exercises because they say that if you can really teach a person to do this and they actually do it, 50% of incontinence will go away. And I would ask both of you, do you think that's true? If they'd actually do it. <laughs> Yes, I mean, that's what the studies show, that they'll get better. And I think it is a, definitely a first-line treatment option, especially for stress incontinence. Young women, I think they should all try muscle exercises with or without the addition of uh, pelvic floor muscle therapy, which is either through a physical therapist or uh, some other type of standardized therapy to contract, help contract the pelvic floor muscles. And then it also helps for uh, mixed urinary incontinence. People have urgency and stress urinary incontinence. So I think it is definitely a first-line therapy for women that is non-invasive, that's very helpful, and something they can do for the rest of their lives. On the, on the other hand, Kegel exercises are very hard to do in a manner that's consistent with true therapeutic outcomes because basically if you're going to do them, you have to do them three times a day forever. And, and 15 you, minutes a uh, time. It's uh, just a chore. I've heard that if you do that tightening, uh, a gradually tightening, like you're going up an elevator and holding it for five seconds and then let, letting it go slowly, like you're coming down from the elevator, uh, that if you did this exercise uh, 200 times a day, uh, that means, you know, 10, 20 times every hour um, that you're awake, uh, it would do it. Uh, so you have to kind of do it all the time to strengthen it's, those yeah, muscles. And, that, and that's the trouble. And I was at a meeting with a Kegel lecture from, I think, Atlanta. And uh, Atlanta's a hotbed of Kegel exercises. Oh, is it? Atlanta and, uh, is so the I hotbed? Said, uh, well, allegedly. But... Uh, <laughs> I asked her what her data was at the end of a typical year of following a patient. She didn't have any data because nobody does it do reliably it. for a year. And that's why you get into support. Uh, typically, a lot of pelvic floor rehabilitation has been done by physical therapists. And that's where they get into using biofeedback to help women try to identify which muscles? The muscles that so they need to use. But tell us there's a, an easy way to do that. Now, but first, explain to me how you, you educate a person about what a Kegel is. Well, Kegel this is said by a woman from a podium from a university. She said, when I'm asked that question, I said, you imagine you're on an elevator packed with people and you have to pass gas. Right. And you do everything you can possibly do to not let that happen in the elevator. That's a first class Kegel exercise. Okay. Now that's a. Now you have to repeat that over and over and over and over and over. And, uh, it's very difficult to get 200 to times a day. Well, I don't know what the I would practice is before I would test that theory. <laughs> <laughs> that would be my suggestion. <laughs> See if you're even capable of doing pra that. Practice passing gas on an elevator? No, no. holding it in. Oh, all right. okay. Or all the right. other. It depends right. on what you so, want to accomplish. But I, I think with pelvic floor <laughs> muscles, uh, you know, when you look at treatment for urinary incontinence, all right, like we talked about earlier, this is a quality of life condition. I mean, it's, it's how you live your life. Are you aging the way you want to age? Are you living the life you want to live with your young kids? However, whether you're male or female. So improving your quality of life. And number one starts is, are we improving the incontinence? Are we making that better? I mean, that should be our outcome measure. Are we meeting their quality of life goals? Are they going out and doing things? And then are we providing therapy that's not only safe and efficacious, but free of uh, minimizing complications? 
Exactly. And that's how you look at it, like when you want to avoid therapy, and that's how, you talk, how I talk to my patients. Okay, we can start here, and this is where we need to, to where to get you to go, and there are risks by moving to the next level, and how do we mitigate those risks, and what's worth taking on for what type of improvement you expect. What a terrible shame it is if a person does not go out, does not get out of the igloo, as we say in South Dakota, uh, because of this problem. Yeah. And I mean, it destroys their life. I mean, it okay. takes away from oh. the socialization they need to do. Yeah. Uh, now, you were talking about other methods. Well, uh, you know, Matt has portrayed aptly that there's a progression of treatment. And the first thing you do is talk to them about how they live. What do they drink? What do they eat? Do they smoke? Do they use a lot of alcohol? What are their sleep patterns? Uh, what's their weight issues and uh, so on and so forth. And so they really need a wellness program, basically. It's something that you know, helps them live a high quality, health enhancing life. After that, then you start moving a little farther along and that would be the introduction of non-invasive things like pelvic floor reconditioning and exercise. That can either be done by yourself by properly doing Kegels or you can avail yourself of other forms of external uh, stimulus, uh, e-stimulation, electrical stimulation, implantation of something that's called a posterior tibial nerve stimulator, variety of things. They tend to be somewhat invasive and then there are, uh, are some non-invasive therapies, particularly uh, very strong magnetic currents can, when passed through the pelvis, stimulate the pelvic nerves, which in turn stimulate the pelvic muscles and induce a Kegel-like contraction of those muscles. And the, those are all legitimate things to try. And the, uh, the uh, AHQ, the uh, quality standards people, have kind of tried to sort this out as to the level of potential benefit from these things. And they've rated and compared drugs. They've rated and compared devices and that sort of thing. And the uh, magnetic stimulation actually has been shown to be about 30% stronger in terms of the muscle contraction, which is what led the FDA to approve those devices back in the late 90s that they did demonstrate big spikes in muscle activity that were larger than the spikes you get with East Stim. So, so I, I was, uh, you know, when you told me that you uh, were working for a, a, a company or that you were the technical uh, thinker guy that was working for a company that was using uh, magnetic, magnetic yeah, uh, extracorporeal magnetic innervation. I, I thought, oh, that yeah. sounds on the edge of... of uh, it does. And it wasn't, but... I think uh, a couple weeks later, I had Matt Stanley on our show, a psychiatrist from, uh, from the uh, Sioux Falls, uh, the head of the hospital down there for behavioral health. And he's talking about using uh, mm -hmm. uh, electronic uh, magnetic, ma magnetic uh, mm -hmm. things to change psychiatric mm -hmm. uh, function. Depression, particularly. And it's amazing. I mean, you know, there's, this is a new field of using magnetic waves to change what's going on. So you have seen... Personally, th so this company has developed methods to use yeah. where they go sit on a, a... Yeah, this goes back to the development of, well, Faraday's law from the 1800s demonstrated that a magnetic wave passing across a closed electrical circuit will induce a current in that circuit. And the body's nerve system is basically a closed electrical circuit. So the electrophysiology of it is, goes back you know, a century and a half or more, two centuries. Uh, so, but uh, the research on it came about from the people that developed the maglev train. Well, if you can lift a train off of a track with magnetic energy and make it go down the track, you know, magnetic energy is truly a force. There's no doubt about that. MRIs, you know, and the contraindications for using these magnetic stimulation things are the same as they are for MRI. You don't do it to pregnant people. You don't do it to people with pacemakers and those okay. sorts of things. But anyway, it's a non-invasive form of treatment, uh, which in effect means there's nothing to lose from trying it. There's no side effect profile, and E-STEM doesn't have much side effect profile either, I don't think. And, I don't and use no, it. I haven't used I, it, mo it. Most of those, those external stimulators and magnetic resonance imaging where they can manipulate uh, the muscle tone and the nerve fibers uh, are all a whole gamut of uh, new therapy that's coming out for urinary issues and pelvic floor disorders. 
uh, unfortunately, we st there's a lot we don't know. Mm -hmm. And even for even uh, more interventional things, such I do a procedure where we stimulate the nerves of the back to help regulate both urinary incontinence, not only for incontinence, but retention uh, and for fecal incontinence. And we know that overriding the nervous system can help kind of regulate this. Just uh, when Dr. Stanley was on talking about the disruption in uh, certain neuroendocrine uh, uh, receptors and, and uh, those manipulations of those receptors can be done electronically is, is, is uh, a new whole therapy, but there is a lot of unknown that we don't understand. So when I talk to someone, we're gonna stimulate the nerves of your back, and they'll say, well, how does this work? And I say, I don't, don't know, know. <laughs> but it might help you. <laughs> and, and so that's not giving our patients the kind of, we wanna know 100%, and there are a lot of therapies out there for urinary incontinence, and I think, which is good, I think that we need a, a vast spectrum, but I think you're seeing now the literature around urinary issues and urinary incontinence, specifically in women, look for more longer outcomes. You know, what are they like after a year? What are they like mm -hmm. after two years? And really pushing academic medicine, and even uh, places where, where I work, where we do research, looking at the more long-term outcome from this, because this is a debilitating condition. And John and I have talked about it, that people spend thousands of dollars on sanitary pads and, and not being able to live their life and, and changing their lifestyles that have a huge, huge, huge cost aspect. To well, it. just the uh, sleep disruption that goes on and a significant number of elderly women hip fractures occur because they get up at night to, go to, the bathroom, to go to the bathroom and eventually they trip over the cat yeah. <laughs> or the dog yeah. and they break a shoulder or they break their hip, hip. and that can be a fatal complication yeah, 20 30 percent death rate of incontinence yeah <laughs> so some people do die from incontinence i guess i guess I mean, they do it's a fair thing i was wondering matt where do you uh, begin as far as medications uh, say you got somebody that Looks like they're going to need a procedure, but you'd like to give them a trial on right. it. The what next step is medication. Yeah, no, I, I think for, I have a skewed practice because most people, when they come to me, it's gotten pretty bad. They've, they've already, already been right. through all they, of them. They've, 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 they've jumped that. every hoop and they've tried yeah. everything. But, you know, I, I like to give medicines a trial and they're all about equal efficacious and they're not as great as we'd hope they would be, but they're, they're worth a try. And we try and do it in a way that's inexpensive. There's now over-the-counter medications available for overactive bladder. There's a patch women can go down to their local pharmacy and purchase right now as they're watching this show without a prescription. Mm -hmm. Right, which, which what are they? That's, that's called the Oxitrol for Her patch. Mm -hmm. And these are uh, uh, transdermal oxybutin, which is a medicine that helps block the bladder from having those spasms like we so talked it about. it takes away the parasympathetic system. It's blocking it that stimulation the of the parasympathetic nervous system. So, and that is getting away. I don't know who's watching this, if it's the, the, the well, neurology call major. Call it anti-muscarinic uh, like it is. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah but yes. parasympathetic is kind of the yang of the yin of, of no, let's adrenaline. Let's, let's, adrenaline is the yin. And parasympathetic yeah. is the yang. It's the, wow. It stimulates the, yes, the it GI makes... tract. So you block the GI tract, you block the tears, you block the, the bladder spasm, uh, and, and then you end up with really dry mouth. Well, you guys gotta be a little careful. You're internist, so a lot of the, your armamentarium is only medications. So That's right, so why am I? You're always poo -poo -pooing the, uh, the well, medications. The... It, it is a therapy, so yeah. I think they have to, everything has to be done. It's not like you come in, oh, you need bladder retraining, you need some muscle exercise on your pelvic floor, you need a medicine, you need surgery. It is not that, that certain. It is an evolving thing, and I think we have to really put the patient's autonomy here first. Because this is not, you have cancer, you need this. This is a health condition, all right? This is educating them about their problem, finding ways that they can live their life to the fullest potential, and what, it, are they, what, what do they want to balance? Right, this? giving them their options. 100%. And let mm -hmm. them kind of yes. wade their way through the, the, yep. the option. The oxybutynin, which is the cheaper option that's over the counter, even in a patch, is the same thing as Vesicare and what's the new one that's out of all of these meds? Well, there's, a, there's there, you know, there's almost 12 of these types of medicines that are out there and, and they're all about equally efficacious, but everyone tolerates them a little bit differently. I think we, we'd love to put everybody in a group and you have to you take that each patient is an individual. They have certain needs. They might be 85 with dementia or they might be 35 year old with uh, two kids at home. They, they, you have to cater those, those medicines or the timing of them or when they use them and then kind of helping them see what they can do to change and then take them up that type of uh, level of, of care. Do we, when do we go on for surgery or, or assessing what, because you know, those medicines aren't gonna help the woman who leaks when she exercises. So I, the only question I have is the side effects have been so awful uh, in my patients and I take care of an awful lot of yep. elderly. 
And so dry mouth, they're dry mouth anyway, and they have lack of tears anyway. So then you dry them out more and they can't tolerate it. Well, they say as many people start these meds, stop them every year. Yeah. It's hard to even a get A higher percentage. I mean, I mean, 60% of them won't be on those medicines at a year. But do they tolerate the longer acting, the brand name, uh, fancier ones? Yeah, I mean, when better? you see someone, if you're going to start a medication or if you're a patient going to start a medication, you probably should start a longer acting medication first than the shorter acting. And, and that's been substantial because it has a decreased risk of uh, side effect profile, you know, less dry mouth, less constipation. And these are side effects. That does not mean everyone gets them. And I think that's a, when people are watching those commercials on TV and that quick phrase is in a mumbled voice at the end that, that <laughs> doesn't mean that's going to happen to you. It could. You know, if this happens, here's what you do. The last complication is death. Yeah. <laughs> that is not for these med medications, <laughs> but yes. Well, like, but um, I would throw in that uh, on the male side uh, that the hype over Cialis that you see on TV is actually pretty well founded. It, it actually does help men who have, you know, urge, stress, incontinence, and overactive bladder particularly. Um, it has something to do with the blocking of receptors in the muscle walls. And, it, you know, these drugs were largely cardiac drugs, the Viagras of to the world. To start with. Yeah, because of their ability to relax smooth muscle and dilate blood vessels. And apparently something similar is going on with these, but they're actually pretty... The good, good for the yeah. for bladder and yeah. condoms for men. Forget the uh, sometimes the side effects can be good, that's, and the side effects are a good thing. But I think if you look at uh, the the medicines, I, I I think everyone wants a simple solution to what's a very complicated issue. And for internists or primary care docs, I think the real issue is focusing on fluid management. Mm -hmm. assessing people with di diaries. I can't tell you how important. If you're a viewer watching the show, mm -hmm. do, it, do your own diary at home. Not only can it be diagnostic, tells you when you're leaking, you can also say, hey, maybe I shouldn't have drank after 5.30 p.m. I wouldn't get up as much or yeah. change your behavior. So a diary, before anyone even goes and sees a doctor, can not only be helpful in helping you understand what's going on, but it also can treat it. Bladder diary, it's called, yeah. and it's very, very effective. And the other thing along those lines would be for medical offices to take the initiative to screen people. Uh, people come in for this, that, and the other thing, and they're already embarrassed about their incontinence and they don't really want to talk about it. But if everybody gets handed a discreet little form and they just check it off, there's eight items, and it comes in with their chart, and it's like, uh, Which does, this, items? does this bother you that you know, you're going yep. every hour, that yep. you're getting up five times a night? that you can't make it to the next rest stop? Does this bother you? Yeah. And they'll often acquiesce and say, it, I'm miserable about this. Yeah. I can't really do anything. I go to exercise and I'm embarrassed. Uh, well, I think it's important. I mean, to, uh, y you need to be uh, an advocate for women's health here is uh, they've simplified men's sexual function mm -hmm. and dysfunction. And they've coined terms that make things a socially acceptable talk about it. erectile dysfunction is a lot better to say than impotence. Mm -hmm. right. All right, and same thing with looking at medicines for women. There's a, they've, they're do, trying to do studies using uh, some of these medicines for men's erectile dysfunction and women's for sexual function. But that's a whole nother uh, subject. But I, I think what one thing as women get older, they too suffer from painful intercourse and uh, not more and libido issues, but also the low estrogen from becoming menopausal can lead to urgency, frequency, and urinary problems in women as well. So that's part of the aging process of the pelvic floor. So that lends uh, the question about menopause uh, and estrogen in for, for, for women in uh, incontinence issue. I know that for a fact there are, uh, uh, there's a lot of people who call and they say, I've got a bladder infection, I just, that's what's really bothering me, I need an antibiotic. And the, the problem is they have vaginitis. They don't have a bladder infection. They've got vaginitis that was a result of the last antibiotic that they had, uh, and they and they don't have uh, their normal flora. That it's been messed up. And uh, so commonly, these women will go to my gynecologist friend, who will put them on a little estrogen uh, cream for the vagina, along with maybe a little metronidazole or some kind of vaginal infection uh, treatment, and their bladder infection symptoms go away. Now, Matt, what's your comment about that? Well, yes. I mean, people can have burning irritation that may present similar to the symptoms of a urinary tract infection, burning with urination, lower abdominal pain, urgency frequency. 
blood in the urine or blood in, uh, coming from the vagina. And I think there's that discrepancy, which brings me to the point that you should not self-treat in those instances. You should see a, uh, a primary care physician or whoever you see on a regular basis to kind of help weed out what are your symptoms. But yes, there's uh, oftentimes an overlap of urinary symptoms and vaginal symptoms, which is why I think urogynecologists are ripe for managing these kind of problems, especially if they're recurrent. And developing that differential becomes really important because we have a big problem with overprescribing antibiotics in this country. And, and your primary and, care doctor might be the, the culprit, too. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, she or he may say, it's, it's a lot easier. Here's your antibiotic. I don't even need to have you come in. Well, now they can just catch you on your on your cell phone within a little app, and you yeah. can look at them. I mean, how do you diagnose a vaginitis over an app? I'm, I'm not quite sure. I figured haven't out figured yet. that one out yet. So what would be your take-home message on that particular topic? Because I wanted to make absolutely sure that we clear, made that clear. When you're having burning, incontinence, urine uh, symptomatology, and you think it's a bladder infection, maybe just vaginitis. Yes and no. I mean, I think the first time, a couple of times that might happen, seeing your physician, knowing your symptoms, because everyone's going to be a little different. And once you've established that care, you can, most patients can recognize that they have an infection or not. Uh, being able to tell the difference between those two is important for them to realize. And then once you have that done, then you can establish your protocol. If this were to happen on a weekend or this would become more recurrent, there are ways to decrease the risk of recurrent vaginal infections or vaginitis. There are ways to re, uh, help recurrent urinary tract infection, which is very, very common, especially in aging uh, patient population. But more importantly, uh, getting those older patients not to overuse antibiotics because there's a, a, a high likelihood that the majority of people will clear these infections on their own, but finding the, the ones that don't are key for seeing a doctor. I have found in the, in the, in the uh, nursing home, and correct me if this has been your experience or not too, John, mm -hmm. uh, that these women will have recurring urine, that the nurses will call. Maggie's got, uh, you know, 90 year old Maggie's got another bladder infection, she's irritable, and she needs an antibiotic. And, uh, and then they've done the urinalysis, which is always a kind of a yep. mixture of vaginal fluid and urine, and it's hard to define. I'm and glad we're on PBS. I, I am glad okay, we are. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, but I found that if you put them on vitamin C 500 four times a day, a lot of those women won't have those recurring symptoms. I know there's some studies that counter that, I, and I can, I, I can see you saying that, but my point is, in my clinical experience, I've had, uh, it's rescued some women from a recurring uh, yeah. problem. I think you're looking at, you're acidifying their urine, and vitamin C acidifies the urine. Better and, than cranberry oh, juice. Yes, and I think if, and if you want to cut down, and, and, and the data's mixed, it's not really strong, uh, even cranberry extract, not the juice, can help kind of basically coat the lining of the uh, renal tract and the bladder. So if there is an infection there, it won't latch on to the bladder wall to cause cystitis or an inf infection of the uh, bladder. And so cranberry extract, vitamin C, there's an old antibiotic called methenamine that we sometimes use that gets renally excreted to help cut down on those recurrent infections are all things you can use. But definitely in those nursing home patients, you bring up a good point in people who have family members that are in nursing home, mental status change is a very common uh, problem or, or association with a urinary tract infection. But I sure hate to overuse the antibiotics in that scenario. So there it is. Any comments? Any, you just agree. Well, I, I, <laughs> I agree. Well, you know I work in Haiti a lot, and we have a very simple diagnostic protocol. What's that? If the discharge is white, they get a suppository, and it clears up. If the discharge is yellow, they're going to get uh, a couple of other things, but we're particularly going to be concerned about sexually transmitted diseases. So we make sure that they get adequately treated for those. But the clear message is you really need a diagnosis. If you don't have a diagnosis, you're just making the problem worse by throwing stuff at it. And uh, it's, it's clear. And, you know, the American Urological Association does not recommend extraordinary workups for incontinence. They don't even, they don't recommend urodynamics and things like that. Good in, history. In certain but, cases. Yeah. In certain well, cases. but I mean, that's a, a, this, this the early onset. But the bladder diary understanding your patient's patterns, urination. So when something goes bump in the night, it's a new thing. And that's worth investigating and, and pursuing. So, you know, getting a proper diagnosis is always right. yeah. Recurring problem, get to the urogynecologist. There you go, get to your local urogynecologist <laughs> as soon as possible. Well, I'm pretty sure Matt doesn't want to see every walking wounded urinary tract infection. No. <laughs> that would be, 
a challenge to manage in the office. Well, he, but your primary care doctor surely should be able to take the time to sort that down. And when things sure. are at a point where they're really, you know, you're getting into some chronic issues with recurrent infections. I mean, one of the most common causes of death from the urinary tract is chronic renal disease, chronic pyelonephritis, undiagnosed, and that's because of chronic retrograde infections, know, infections. going from the bladder up it, to the kidney. Right. They're low grade, smoldering. They're not diagnosed. They just sort of kill the kidneys. Yep. Now let's talk about if we've done these conservative things and we've done the antibiotics and so on and so forth for the bladder and uh, we've done our our oxybutynin kind of medicines and now we're going to the next step. You know, there's pessaries, there's, uh, there's tacking of the bladder, there's procedures, there's meshes. What, what, tell us about the surgical intervention, Matt. Well, I think the surgical intervention for stress urinary incontinence, this is the leakage with activity when you're running up the stairs and jumping, playing with your kids, uh, right. wanting to get back into running, that is because the urethra is no longer well supported and there's ways we can do this. Historically, we used to tie the bladder up to the pelvic bone called a Birch urethropexy uh, or uh, Marshall Marchetti Krantz, you guys right. might have remembered that. But that's where we, we use a permanent stitch and tie that to the bone. Or we would take a strip of connective tissue underneath the belly or along the um, muscle of a, a tendon along the muscle of the thigh and place that underneath the urethra to prevent leakage of urine. Very invasive procedures but worked fairly well and that led to the development of an anti-incontinence procedure for stress incontinence called a sling procedure and this is where we place a small piece of synthetic mesh underneath the urethra to prevent that from leaking and uh, there are different variants of that they can use it with biologic materials which are taken from either cadavers or uh, animals or we can use synthetic mesh similar to the mesh they use for hernia repairs in the Great. abdomen and it was less invasive surgery uh, and fairly effective with low complication risk. And that's kind of revolutionized how many urinary incontinence procedures we're doing because of its quick return to activity, it's an outpatient procedure, and it's very effective. Do you take the uterus out most of the time? That is just a simple out outpatient procedure, but you do not need to take the uterus out for urinary incontinence. That would be only if there was some uterine problem or if it was prolapsing. And it was just prolapsing means it's coming prolapse out. Prolapse is like basically a hernia inside the vagina where you've lost support to the bladder or the uterus or the area between the rectum and the vagina, which is falling out where a woman will feel pressure or heaviness in the vagina. China, which so, is oftentimes correlates with urinary incontinence, so the standard workup is ruling that out when you're evaluating right. someone for urinary incontinence. Um, I wonder if you could comment on Botox. Sure. So that, those are the treatments for, for stress urinary incontinence. And then for urge urinary incontinence, this is like the overactive bladder syndrome who have failed medications, muscle exercises, behavioral changes. Um, there you're looking at uh, either addressing the nerve problems, stimulating the nerves of the back, or you talked about stimulating uh, a nerve along the ankle where they can give electrostimulation to that. But then that helps kind of override the nervous system. What botulinum toxin does is we inject it through a cystoscope or a camera in the bladder to uh, uh, inject the, the toxin into the bladder to paralyze it. Basically, this relaxes the bladder so it doesn't spasm as much. Mm -hmm. And this is an outpatient procedure. It's done in the office, very minimally invasive and, and uh, effective. effective, similar to, to medication. But again, long-term, multiple years of, of studies, we're, we're slowly le learning it, but it's becoming, as you do more of it, more additive, and it might be helpful, but it is a nice therapy for, especially for your older patients who can't tolerate the medicines, the mm -hmm. side effects. Uh, there, there's a, a good type of therapy. And then you're looking at uh, more invasive techniques after that as we're removing the bladder or doing other types of surgeries there. Mm -hmm. Now there was a surgical procedure that you see lawyers advertising on there. Sure. Uh, they're saying, oh, have you had this yeah. mesh procedure, blah, blah, blah. What was that? And has that, is there still you being done and is it appropriate or not appropriate or what, what's the, all this lawsuit stuff? Yeah, so uh, this is what I tell my patients when they come to my clinic, I kind of give the gist. So uh, these mesh slings came out in the mid 90s to help prevent leakage when women laugh, cough, right. or sneeze. And in 2004, they developed a sling that goes through the groin muscles called the transoptrator sling. And there was different approaches, less invasive uh, approaches to treat this. And they were being able to get this mesh 
into the underneath the urethra in a very minimally invasive manner. And the companies that were making these devices thought, hey, why don't we use mesh to hold the bladder up completely or hold, hold down the rectum or resuspend the vagina for prolapse. And as we did more prolapse surgeries with mesh and anti-incontinence procedures with mesh, in 2008, we saw, hey, we're seeing a lot of complications. Either people are getting pain from this, erosions, pain with intercourse, infections, worsening urinary issues. And that led the uh, FDA to say, hey, let's take a look at this. And they met after 2008 and had a whole meeting looking at this. And so in 2011, they put out this statement saying, the slings for anti-incontinence procedure, the traditional ones, the TOT, TVT, that go behind the pubic bone, um, are probably safe and can be on the market, but any variant of that or any mesh used for prolapse, pelvic organ prolapse where tissue falls down, we'd like you to get more data on this. And the companies wanted to do this, some did not want to do this, some pulled their products from the market. Uh, there have been some other products that have been recalled because the, the mesh was, was, wasn't quite the same as what they've been using for hernias. And those much are off the market, but the mesh is still available, but the uh, there are class action lawsuits against the companies that make these mesh. Not saying that these all my mesh are recalled and, and bad for you, and some are good, some are bad, and that's the conversation we have to individualize therapy right. for. But you're seeing the advertisements on TV to get more people into a class action lawsuit, and I think the statute of limitations are coming up why the advertisements are out there m more Try, often. Trying to get the, the big yes. group. Yes, to, to and I think that's a conversation you have to have. Here are the different therapies. Here are the risks and benefits. Here are the results of our mm -hmm. outcomes for the long term. Mm -hmm. And I think for stress incontinence, uh, utilizing synthetic mesh with those procedures is still safe with a complication rate less than 4%, but it's still a permanent material, and that's a longer conversation you need to have individually right. with the patient. Risks with these procedures. All, all procedures have risk, and they need to be discussed. Absolutely. All right, so we have like two minutes left. I want to turn to you and give me a one-minute summary. I want to make sure that you hit everything that you want people out there to hear. Well, I would start with getting a proper history and diagnosis. The bladder diary is critical to that. The second is take a good history, find out what they're eating, what they're drinking, what they're smoking, and you know what their general health issues are. And then from there, go with you know the physical exam. You know what's what kind of shape are they in? You know, they would benefit from uh, weight loss, exercise, all the usual kinds of things, and then consider instructing them, sending them maybe to a physical therapist who have traditionally been one of the first places. Uh, they've been people that have been doing pelvic floor therapy for a long time. And if they can get them trained, really get them committed to Kegel exercises, Kegel exercise, they may begin to see some improvement. And that improvement will help to foster compliance. If that doesn't work, then begin to think about putting in some form of device that stimulates the pelvic floor muscles. And really with the uh, magnetic uh, wave therapy, there's virtually no side effects. Uh, you can do six to nine treatments and find out if they're gonna have a response to it. Uh, E-STEM is a possibility too, although it doesn't uh, get as specifically deep into the pelvic floor as the uh, EXMI okay. type thing does. And then from there, you really need these more complex referrals for people like Matt to yeah. evaluate you know, when, we, when all else fails. And when, el when all else fails, what else? Well, there's always something you can do. There's always, there's always the, the next level of, of care. And, but I think my take home message with incontinence is empowering the, the patient they have to be involved in this process. They have to do the bladder diary. They have to take ownership of this. What are their goals? Goals. So when you get a packet from me and you see me for this sort of thing, the first three lines, they say, what are your goals of therapy? All right, that's, that's how I'm gonna help you. And how do you wanna do that becomes a, a, an open dialogue between yeah. me as a physician and that, that person as, as a patient. I mean, they're, they're in the, the driver's ship. I'm here to help them and keep them yeah. safe. Right? Totally agree that they need to understand what are the expectations here. What's what are the reasonable, expectations? What's possible. Not everybody has the yeah. same potential. Stay in good shape and exercise. We'll be yeah. back right after this. As your baby grows, there are new surprises and adventures every day. With each new milestone, remember, immunizations are safe and one of the best ways to protect against serious diseases especially between birth and age five. Now that my grandson Henry has reached his first birthday and our granddaughter Stella has arrived, we're making sure that they stay on their immunization schedules. Schedule your children's immunizations today for baby's sake. The word continence 
is a derivative of first ancient Latin, continent, or to contain, or hold, or exercise restraint. And second, modern English, to control urinary or fecal discharge. Add the describing word urinary and the prefix in, and it means loss of bladder control or a leaky faucet. The simple words urinary incontinence, however, define a single symptom with multiple and complex causes. It's this symptom that vexed 20 to 30 percent of young female adults, 30 to 40 percent of middle-aged females, and 30 to 50 percent of the female elderly. In general, twice as many women have incontinence than men, with men developing this condition mostly due to prostate problems as they age. By far, the most common kind of urinary incontinence happens because of weakness in the pelvic muscles that open or close off the flow of urine. The loss of strength of these important muscles can happen in women because Childbirth or surgery injures the nerves, muscles, and ligaments below the urinary bladder, or because these muscles are simply not exercised enough, and over time, muscle tone relaxes too much to hold back the urinary flow. This kind of leakage is called stress incontinence because it usually happens in women when, when she stresses her bladder by lifting or coughing or sneezing or laughing at an unprepared time. If you ask anyone dealing with this, however, they'll tell you stress incontinence is no laughing matter. Another type of urinary incontinence is called urge incontinence, when there comes a sudden need to urinate without enough time to get to the bathroom. This occurs when the muscle that surrounds and squeezes the bladder goes into uncontrolled spasm, making an urgent urge to go. This can happen if there is irritation of the bladder from infection, tumor, overdilation. Also, certain medicines, an oversensitized set of bladder nerves, or even an overawareness of the sensation of urine within the bladder can bring this urgent urge and incontinence. There's also overflow incontinence, when the bladder is overfilled from an enlarged prostate blocking flow, or from the loss of bladder squeeze from diabetic neuropathy, for example. Functional incontinence occurs when the brain or bone disease prevents the individual from being able to get to the bathroom. But most incontinence is from either stress incontinence or a combination of stress and urge incontinence. The treatment for urinary incontinence is dependent on understanding that exact cause or causes for the problem, and in recent years has resulted in a whole new subspecialty helping us deal with a leaky faucet. Well, this brings us to the end of our show, and I want to personally thank both our wonderful guests, Dr. Matt Barker, who is a urogynecologist from Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and Dr. John uh, Langdon, who is a internist and a researcher and a think tank guy who's producing for a, a creative group in uh, Florida and a, also a governor of the ACP for Florida. And I want to thank Pier 81 for uh, bringing uh, us uh, this sp special spot and for serving our crew a fabulous meal and doing all uh, for us that they've done today. Thank you so much, Pier 81. Uh, that philosophical place in this beautiful uh, environment of Lake Ponce that brings us to, uh, to think about what Gandhi uh, said, and he's, he put it this way, it is health that is real wealth and not pieces of gold and silver. So from all of us on here on On Call with the Prairie Doc, thank you and good night. Funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc is provided in part by 
Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call Television as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, an organization working with the state's healthcare community to improve quality of care as part of the Great Plains Quality Innovation Network. Additional funding is provided by Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, Avera Heart Hospital, Brookings Health System, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Dakota Care, Orthopedic Institute, Physicians Care Sanford Clinic Community Service Committee, South Dakota State Medical Association, Swift Health Communications, and Vance Thompson Vision. Close captioning for On Call with the Prairie Doc is provided by Avera, Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation.